Welcome to Combat, hopefully a shorter video than Towns and Parties was. It's an aspect of Thea that has the graphical resonance of a collectible card game, but tends to play out a lot like a very old school JRPG. Although now that I think about it, CCGs and old school JRPGs play out a lot in the same way anyway, what with selecting party members in turns and everyone waiting to fight until all characters are given their orders. Huh. Well, enough pontificating. So here I am, ready to engage. Normally, I'd have three options for this combat, but I'm going with a straight fight because it has a couple extra aspects that the other eight skill challenges don't. Normally, on starting a combat, I'd end up on a screen like this, where I can randomly reshuffle my team, but I have that option off. This fight will be against two unliving corpses and six slightly weaker skeletons. And I'm not going to auto-resolve, as that won't demonstrate anything. On the right here, you can see what skills come into effect for this specific type of combat. I'll flash to a showing of all nine possible types of combat here real fast. Feel free to pause the video if you want to see this in detail, or just head over to the ever-mentioned wiki, which I'll once again link in the description. Alright, here we are. By random chance, the opponent went first and placed a character into the field. We know the enemy had 8 characters, which are all up here, and we have 12 members in our party down here. They are broken up, randomly, into two positions. Technically, the left side is called offensive and the right side is called tactical, but I much prefer to call them frontline and support given how they act during all this. First up, what the various battlefield buttons and numbers do. The purple flag up here is Surrender Challenge. If clicked, you will lose the fight. Which isn't great, but if you know you're going to lose, at least this option will save you from getting smacked around first. The two numbers here are how many... Fine, I'll call them cards. Cards you get to play before the other side goes again. The button that looks like the end turn button will give up the rest of my cards this turn, if I have some reason I want to let the opponent play more of his first. And the red, we'll call it the YouTube Next Video button, causes me to pass all of my future card plays for this round. Basically, it's me saying to the computer, I don't want to play any more cards, so go ahead and play all the rest of yours, and let's do this. Oh, and I suppose I should define the word round. A round is everyone playing their cards in turns, followed by two phases of actual attacking. Now, let's look at one of my guys. I'll hover the mouse over him, and his portrait shows up enlarged on the right here. The number on top is his hit point value, which in this type of challenge is the sum of his health and armor. If this number hits zero, he will be downed and out of combat. Below that is his attack type and direct damage amount, which all characters have. After that is three more optional numbers. This one is his shielding, this one is poison damage, and this one is life leech. Finally, the number in the bottom right here is... Well, technically it's his relative strength rating, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just call it his level. I'll get to attack type later, let's start with damage. When dealing damage, all three of these numbers are added up, so this guy will be hitting for this much. Of that damage, anything counted as poison will count double, but only if the target he's going to hit is already missing hit points. And the damage counted as leech will be added back into his hit point total, but only up to its maximum value. The shielding rating gets added to my hit points, and indeed, until the shield is depleted, the character won't take damage at all. So, let me play my first card to show what happens. I'll pick this high shielding individual here. So, looking here, you can see that the shielding value is now up here, as the hit points have this little plus at the end of them. So until this much damage is done to him, no actual damage will be done to the health total. I'll play another guy to let the opponent get another turn. Okay, the opponent has taken his turn, and now here we are with a field of cards in play, and it's my turn again. Let's look at the backline characters with all these special options on them. 
Since I have two cards to play, the first thing I'll do is take one guy and use this Get Closer option. You'll notice that put him on the field just like a frontliner, but with these little blue question marks floating around. I'll get to that in a bit. You'll notice that not everyone in the back line has every option, because some don't have every possible skill relevant to this challenge. But let's take a guy with every possible tactical option as our example. So other than Get Closer, there are six other options available to a backline member. These are called Tactical Abilities, and the number next to them is how strong this character is at that ability. And here comes the fun part. How each skill uses that number, and which part of the battle it targets. Break out your notebooks, this will be on the test later. First, Confuse. Confuse will search everyone currently on the battle line from right to left and look for any enemy that has a level equal to or less than the strength of this tactic. If it finds one that isn't already confused, then it will confuse that target which would add the floating blue question marks to it that my character over here has. Think of this as sort of a misdirection ploy. Second, Counter Tactic. This will target the enemy's support cards. It will take any one card and take it out of this round of combat, but it has to be of a level equal to or less than the skill rating. And if there is no enemy card in the support side that is equal to or less than the skill of the character, you just ended up wasting your turn. The good news is, as long as a target does exist that is valid, it will get chosen, so it's not like you can accidentally waste your turn. Third is Counter Offense. It is exactly like Counter Tactic, only it will choose a card from the frontline side instead. Due to this order of calculation, first, checking if any valid target exists, and then, second, randomly selecting from the ones that qualify, there is an incentive for you, in both Counter Offense and Counter Tactic, to try to use the lowest skilled card that will still hit something first, so that you can much more consistently pick who you want to eject from the combat round. Of course, knowing your opponent's card levels is something you will have to learn through playing the game. You can think of Counter Offense and Counter Tactic as skills that cause one of your characters to distract one enemy character for a full round. Fourth, Shield Ally. This will look on the main battle line from right to left for any of your characters. The first one it finds, it will add the card's shield rating to it. Think of it as someone raising his shield in front of a friend. Fifth is Support Ally. This will look on the main battle line from right to left for any of your characters. The first one it finds, it will add the card's ranged attack value to the active character's damage rating. Think of it as a support character firing a bow at a target his friend is fighting. And sixth, first action. This will look on the main battle line from right to left for any of your characters. The first one it finds with a level equal or lower than your card's skill it will move that character from its current position to the front of the field. Think of this one as, I don't know, when the Hulk picks up Wolverine and throws him around the battle, I guess? Uh, anyway, those are the ways your supporters can assist the front line. You can also think of them grouped up a couple different ways. One grouping is that these four skills affect the field, always from right to left, while the other two go after the decks. Another way to group them is that these four skills check the character's skill against the target's level, while these other two just add their raw values as a buff. Any card that is used as a tactical ability, or any card removed from play by a tactical ability, goes into a discard pile on the side here. Let me demonstrate. Okay, you can now see cards over here for both me and the opponents. These are the discard piles. They are out of this round. I know that's a lot of explanation, but if you play out a Fighter 5 in your own game, I'm sure it'll all click for you. 
the basics anyway, advanced tactical decisions will come later. And having used that card, the enemy got to go again. And lastly, in this pre-combat setup phase, is attack type. There are three types of attack in Thea. I'll pull an example for each of those three. The first being normal, as denoted here by the sword. It is normal, nothing special. Second is blunt, although I prefer to think of it as cleave, denoted by the hammer icon. The way this works is, if this guy's attack kills his target, then any leftover damage will spill onto another target. It can only hit twice, however, so sorry no building a dude with a hammer and 200 damage one shotting a dozen guys. Third is Pierce, although I prefer to think of it as First Strike, denoted by the spear icon. When this is used, if the last card in line on the active field is an enemy card, then the character will get placed right before it and do 50% of its direct damage as an immediate bonus. Let me demonstrate. The final guy on the field right now is, in fact, right here and is an enemy. So if I play a spear guy, this happens. He has been placed to his left and his health has dropped. Your opponents can have all the same tactical and offensive abilities that you do, so the placement part of this fight is kind of a mind game. And another good reason to have a wide variety of skill users in your party. Even people with low skill can be useful, as many fights in this game involve a group of small fries to go along with the heavy hitters. And tactically removing a rat at just the right time can be the difference between your 100 damage dwarf smacking a dragon or the starving wolf next to him. So, let me run out the placement phase real fast, using a couple of the tactical stills to try and give some live examples. And so here come the two attacking phases. Combat is resolved by taking each person from left to right and having it deal its damage to an enemy. The game manual says that each person will attack the nearest opponent, but that's ambiguous, so let me give the exact logic. If a card has no opponents on the left of it, then it will attack the first opponent it finds on the right. If a card has no opponents on the right of it, it will attack the first opponent it finds on the left. If a card has opponents in both directions, then it will find the nearest opponent in each direction and flip a coin. 50-50 chance which of these two guys will get attacked, regardless of which one is technically nearest. On the first turn of attacks, anyone with the floating blue question marks is considered not ready either because they were supporting in back and are trying to run to the front, or because an enemy tactic distracted them. Ergo, anyone with a floating blue question mark will have their attack skipped. Once the first pass is done, any floating blue question marks are removed, and then anyone who is still alive will do combat on the second pass, following the same rules as the first. If, at any point, there are no opponents on the main battlefield, then any remaining attackers will switch their target to a random card in the discard pile. If two attack passes happen, and both sides still have live cards, then anyone who isn't yet knocked out will be returned to the hand, randomly shuffled, and another round begins. Any damage done to a character's health will persist, but any protective shielding will be refreshed anew. If at any point, every single card on one side, both in play and discarded, is knocked out, then the combat is over. The couple extra aspects that I mentioned near the start of this video, that direct combat has that other challenges don't, is this. One, 
Only the direct combat has blunt. Every challenge has some form of pierce, but only someone swinging a hammer around in main battle can cleave. And two, any damage you take in straight combat is maintained after the fight is over as missing health, represented as wounds. You'll see that in a sec. What lost health means is, and how you get it back, I went over in the characters video. So let me end the combat now. After the combat is over, you will go back to the event screen for the rewards, and maybe some more event flavor text. When looking at the rewards, some of them will usually be equipment pieces. You can see those in more detail by right-clicking them, and if you decide you don't want them, you can left-click it before exiting. That will place this little recycle symbol over the piece, and instead of the gear, you'll get some of the materials that it was crafted with instead. It's basically the same as if you recycled it from the group's inventory screen. Basically a quality of life thing. So, with the combat over, the other thing I saved until this video is the crafting tab of the research screen. I saved this until now because there are eight branches to this tree, and seven of them have to do with combat equipment. Let's get the other one out of the way first. The cooking tab, which opens up new food recipes. Since having a variety of food gives passive bonuses, it is nice to have, but it's rather hard to equip an apple pie, so only tangentially related to combat. This branch here is the ranged weapons, which create items that increase range damage, and not much else. And this tab is armor. I went over their effects in the character video, but they are mostly for armor, shielding, and if a gemstone is used, a random bonus. These four branches correspond to melee weapons. Swords, axes, hammers, and spears. The first three of those have one-handed variants on the inner ring and a two-handed version on the outer. The spear tree is always two-handed. I'll save an in-depth discussion for a future strategy video, but the quick breakdown is this. For any given material, on average, spears do the least damage but give users the piercing bonus, hammers are the second lowest but give users the blunt bonus, swords are the second highest and give bonus shielding, and axes have no special extras but the highest base damage. And just like armors, weapons get a random extra bonus if a gemstone is used in construction. And if you are really lucky, that extra bonus is more damage. And lastly, the accessory tree down here, so that you can make jewelry and artifacts. These objects have a wide variety of skill boosts they can provide, and yes, there is one that increases damage if you really want it. But I include this in the combat video because some jewelry can, specifically, give you skills that enable the pierce bonus in the non-fight challenges. So sure, if you want to become better at sneaking, you can make a silver brooch to increase your sneaking. Or you can get all meta and make a topaz earring and gain the light steps attribute. I'll, as I often do, link the wiki page for jewelry recipes in the video description, but really, my recommendation when it comes to accessories, I mean if you are new to the game, is to build a wide variety for yourself. At worst, it will give you tons of research points, and at best, you'll have just what you need, just as you need it. And that's the combat, and I guess combat equipment, primer. As such, I am now done the entire introduction and manual portion of this Samaz guide. Next video, I will be starting the strategy guide portion by playing the game, starting at turn 1, to give you a good idea on how to successfully start your Thea journey. Now, as promised, the rest of this video will be me replaying the sample fight from earlier in real time, and I'll actually be trying to win it instead of making suboptimal plays just as demonstrations. But there will be no explanations from this point forward, so if you think you know what you need to and don't need to spend any more time watching this video, you can safely head out.
and with that fight over, I'll even throw in a bonus one. I'll do the fight one more time, only this time I'll go for a non-fight challenge option instead. 